See, I'm myself in a little bit of two minds uh, whether I should address uh, the older people in the room or the younger people in the room. Uh, so let me uh, choose to address the younger people in the room and if I'm disappointing the older people in the room, uh, we will take it up some other day. So, because uh, that was my understanding also in discussion with Apurva gave me the feeling that it's primarily for uh, <coughs> research scholars, right? So, uh, I also, uh, it's okay, I, I will not need it. Uh, I'll stand and speak, I'll use the whiteboard a little bit, then I'll be freer. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I thought, uh, I'll try to kind of uh, develop the question of psychoanalysis and philosophy. And to me the question uh, comes like this. One is the classic way of approaching it, philosophy of psychoanalysis. So philosophy is the arbiter or the framework which we have. Like philosophy of science, philosophy of history, philosophy of psychology, we'll have philosophy of psychoanalysis. So philosophers would say what is right and wrong about psychoanalysis and Grunbaum's work is a famous work which uh, had an evaluative framework to see what is psychoanalysis, is it a science, what is truth function in psychoanalysis, what is its epistemological basis, etc. Et so, so one framework is to approach it through philosophy of psychoanalysis. The other is psychoanalyzing philosophy. So you may do that. So uh, psychoanalysts may come in and try and do all kinds of things with philosophy and philosophers special. So they may, they may take a look at, at uh, philosophy and try to understand them in terms of the kinds of not diagnostic frames exactly, but kinds of um, structural framings psychoanalysis would have about human subjects. So they would try to <laughs> many old friends. Uh, so, uh, so, so they would try to understand it uh, in terms of a kind of psychoanalysis of philosophy. At times it would get reduced to a banality psychoanalysis of philosophy. Let us for the time being reject both ways. For today's discussion, for the next 45 minutes, let us move <coughs> into these two ways, philosophy of psychoanalysis or psychoanalyzing philosophy. 
one day then and this led me to the difficulty once uh, Abu was set it up and I was wondering how to go about it and, and um, I was actually uh, going back to a seminar Jacques Lacan delivered in Paris to philosophers and that's the only time he put it this way that this is the only time I'm speaking to philosophers or I'm speaking, he was actually speaking in a philosophy department and, and that book is titled uh, My Teaching. It's, it's come out now as a, as a book, it's published as a book, um, it's titled My Teaching and um, in that uh, we may find a way, way of going about today's discussion. So I had a first order problem, how to set up today's discussion. Do I set it up in the philosophy of psychoanalysis mode, do I set it up in the psychoanalyzing <coughs> philosophy mode or do I set it up uh, in, in a way Lacan suggests in my teaching, that very really short book, whether, whether that, that is one way of going about it. There the question becomes, it's a very dangerous question actually, what happens to philosophy after psychoanalysis? I think that is a much more dangerous question than psychoanalyzing philosophy. Uh, uh, it is a question that asks that what will happen to psychoanalysis after philosophy? Or what will happen to philosophy after psychoanalysis? So you may reverse the question. The department may think, let me look at what would happen to psychoanalysis after philosophy. So so I was having I was having a uh, a kind of debate. Uh, this is okay as a setting. <laughs> we usually dim the lights. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the the way of, of setting it up could be uh, could be this that uh, and and that's not the route I'll take. But let me foreground that route first. I was having a debate with my colleagues and friends, psychoanalysts actually, at Ambedkar University. And the debate took this form. And the nature of the debate, God, it's been recorded, but it's okay. Uh, the nature of the, no, it's okay, I'm okay with it. Uh, the nature of the debate uh, was this, whether psychoanalytic psychotherapy and deconstructing normalcy. Deconstructing normalcy is a primarily Derrida paper huh? uh, looking at psychology. And psychoanalytic psychotherapy is a primarily psychoanalysis paper, Indian psychoanalytic understanding of the self and subject, etc. Et Therapeutic also, you know. Whether these would become electives. So, some students want to go into critical theory, they go the deconstructive psychoanalysis way. Uh, and some students go into proper psychoanalysis, whatever that means. They do psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And there was a debate in the department whether this should be a choice. And students, this is a fourth semester course, so you have done all your things, now you make a choice in life, tea or coffee. Okay. Uh, and, uh, my position <coughs> was there cannot be any choice. And the one liner is this there is no choice between psychoanalysis and deconstruction. There is no choice between critical and clinical. The choice is between pre deconstructive psychoanalysis and post deconstructive psychoanalysis. But see, this is set up in the framework of psychoanalysis after philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking deconstruction as the ground and I'm saying psychoanalysis can now be pre-deconstructive or post-deconstructive. There's no choice over here. You have to do deconstructing novels. The question is how you do psychoanalysis after that. <coughs> Irrespective, oblivious of Derrida or working with Derrida. Interestingly, in the deconstructing 
normalcy course this time. I took up a core psychoanalytic test. So everybody comes with the expectation this will be a text by the rhythm. But I take up a core psychoanalysis test and read that one book, try to read that one book as far as we could over four months. Interestingly, this text is by Abraham and Turok, the two Hungarian psychoanalysts. And the foreword to this book, a very long foreword, is written by the okay. So my position was, yes, it will be psychoanalysis, but post deconstructed psychoanalysis. But that's one way of going about it. Psychoanalysis after philosophy. And I've had my problems over here that psychoanalysis needs to take note of movements in philosophy. There's one chair here. Uh, and they have to decide now. Uh, so, uh, 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 two would have solved the problem. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and we are always in such difficult choice in life. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and that is the question actually. Uh, psychoanalysis perhaps raises for philosophy. So, so in that sense, what I'm trying to do today is see, and it's a very dangerous thing to do in a philosophy department, but that's when it is interesting. Uh, otherwise, everybody is happy. Uh, what is philosophy after psychoanalysis? So that is where I set up the title of the talk. And you must have sensed it by now. The take is on the bullet. Um, on a framing, I'm not saying it's a it's a statement, it's a proposition, on a kind of framing that Descartes proposes which has gone global, I think, therefore I am. And the question before us is, what happens, what does psychoanalysis do with this proposition that has had its effect on us, I think, therefore I am. So, one question today, I mean one day, you cannot do much, you can take up only one angle uh, or, or one kind of angularity in philosophy and open it up and see what will happen, what will happen uh, and perhaps what will happen in the next 30-40 minutes is that we will have a difficult relationship with the earth. We will uh, Rehabilitate Descartes, but also dislocate him in certain ways. So this becomes then the work, and one and, and I'm taking just one angle. Like it's impossible to do psychoanalysis and philosophy in one discussion like this, and it's better to take only one angle and see in a somewhat dense manner what happens to that angle once you track it. So it should not become a general exposition of what psychoanalysis is, but track just one question, one framing, one problematic and see what happens to that problematic. And it will lead to both rehabilitation and dislocation or displacement perhaps and let us see what happens. So I think, therefore I am, and that opens up for Lacan. I'm writing, but please don't treat this as a class, because it's not a class. I'm writing only because I have to be attentive to both syntax and the structure of the signifier over here. Okay, so that is why I'm writing. Please, it's not a class. I'm just writing to set it up. And this can open up a number of number of things for us and also I'm trying to communicate clearly it shows as Lacan 
or we would like to ponder upon it, that this kind of framing is premised on a logical connection. And the logical connection is the therefore that the, something has to be marked. And the strength of the proposition, and let me call it a proposition from now on, is that it marks a logical connection. And this is one important point, that, that it's the therefore that therefore is important. And, and, and one needs to see what happens to this logical connection. <coughs> and this therefore, see there are two possibilities to this therefore. This therefore can be blocked. This therefore can be kept open. And Descartes, the quintessential doubter, per se, doubt everything, doubt even my existence. Okay. The quintessential skeptic becomes henceforth a philosopher of the logical or the therefore. What will he do with this therefore? Where will he halt the dialectic or the play? The dialectic and play comes from two different traditions. The dialectic or the play of doubt. Where will he or how will he halt it? And the dialectic or the play is between am and thought. And this is a very, very interesting proposition. A very slim, slim logical connection is made. It is on the predicate of thought that I can access, substantialize, and substantialize is the very important point over here. Substantialize and amnes. I think that I can stop to think on being, on amnes, is that very slim possibility, is the very slim substance I get to reflect on you. And it's a very interesting proposition, actually. Now the point over here for us is, Will we substantialize the I with respect to thought? Or will we keep it at a desubstantialized, <coughs> hollowed out void? Not a thing, but nothing. Not a nothing. So this is the difficult point one is, that yes, we may substantialize this into a kind of conscious, reflective self-transparency, I think, therefore, I am the amnes determinant on the thought. So one possibility is to substantialize it here and hold the dialectic or the plane. The other possibility is that one keeps it open, forever open, and what we have arrived at is not substance. It's not a res cogitans. It's not a substance that you have arrived at. You have arrived at a slim possibility of marking amnes. This opens up in psychoanalysis a few ways. One, where will I locate this proposition? Will I locate it in a kind of substantialization of the I or the subject? And I'm saying I and subject now for the time being. They also require qualification. Or do I not substantialize it? I keep it open, playful, as a hollowed out void, as a fossil mark 
and what is a holotype for it as an impression. Okay. So think think of a fossil mark. What is a fossil mark? A fossil mark is where the hollowed out void of the organism is there. The organism is not there. Only the footprint is there. The foot is not there. The print is there. The footprint is there. Is the footprint of that examination where you are there. You don't have it in a substantial sense. You only have it in a logical sense. But nevertheless, this desubstantialized subject is what you have. Now this opens for us one chapter in Acre. That chapter is called On the Subject Who is Finally in Question. On the subject who is finally in question, and I, as I was contemplating which title of the talk I give, I had a moment's thought, let the title of the talk be on the subject which is finally in question. The subject which is finally in question is philosophy of a certain kind. I could have gone that way. Okay. But then I thought, okay, no, let me go this way. I think they're from uh, I am. And, and this opens up uh, for, for, for philosophy a question not just of the subject who is in question, but of the subject which is in question. And, and, and that is a kind of opening this creates. This could be taken further. And this is how thereafter it got written. In psychoanalysis, this is written not as a therefore, not as a logical connection, but as, I think, there I am, as a place. Let us get the sense of there. There is a question of a place, of a placeholder, the place of non-place, a place that is not essentially place. It is not placed with certainty or with substance. It's not there, and yet it is there. Which is why I was saying it's it's not a thing, but it's not nothing. Okay. So this desubstantialized experience of the subject is where one is experiencing it, and that becomes the question of the day. And the there opens up, I think, there I am. Is it a question of place? Is, is the question. That it's not necessarily a logical closure. I think, therefore I am. But it's a question of a place for a non-place. Marked by a kind of void. And that place is what one is looking for. Okay, so so we'll develop this. We'll develop this. The therefore comes over here in a much more complicated manner. It becomes, I think, therefore I am. And this opens up and which is why I was writing, because I had to work on this, the fourfold enunciation in analytic thought of four kinds of discourses of four kinds of discourses only and only within which the desubstantialized subject can be seen to be inaugurated. That's all. I'm not even saying found. I'm saying can be seen to be inaugurated. The master's discourse, the university discourse, the hysterics discourse, and the analyst discourse. Now I'll have to explain what these are. Okay. But, but one will come to that. So this opens up then a way of experiencing the subject not as something that is within, 
but as something that is without. And this is a this is a tricky point actually, which is why psychoanalysis as against conventional philosophies of the self suggested not just the unconscious, the unconscious as putting under erasure the Cartesian subject is a point we know. We have, we have heard about it here and there, in corridors at least we have heard. Somewhere somebody said the unconscious and it was putting under erasure or problematizing Cartesian consciousness and all that, we would say that. But the critical, critical question is that there is nothing that is to be found inside in the sense of a substantive incited I. And this led to a rather difficult proposition the unconscious is outside. I always thought that there is something significantly inside and we are seething with some insight and in the insight there is something that is a seething cauldron okay, of eel, of, of a can of worms or something like that or there is some thinking eye, some, some eye, some substantive I or self within, something within that is there in me for somebody to discover or objectify. And this opens up that little angle for us where unconscious is proposed to be outside and not inside. And this opens up a host of discussions. Uh, one known, very known, in at least Lacanian circles, the unconscious is structured <coughs> like language, and I'll get into that. But the critical, critical question is the unconscious is outside, not inside. The unconscious is the other's <coughs> discourse. The unconscious is the other's discourse, big other. Huh? This is not the Levinasian other, this is the Lacanian other. Uh, the unconscious is, is the other's discourse. And, and we'll, we'll ponder upon that, we'll, we'll work on that. Time. Time is a problem. We'll work on that. But uh, uh, in that sense, what happens that I think, therefore I am, slowly moves to a question of place rather than logic. Even if logic, a slim logic, even if place, the non-place of place, or the place of non-place, or an impression, what Foucault in History of Madness suggests a hollowed out thought, it's an impression. And, and paleontologically, what we have is always an impression. We never have the organism. From the impression, we make a sense of the organism. So the subject is an impression. And that impression is what one is tracking in, say, for example, the analytic setting, or what we call clinical work. One is working, or in group processes, one is working on the impression of the subject. This opens up then that the subject cannot be located inside, within, but in terms of what, structurally speaking, are four discourses, why they are called discourses, why there are only four, why they are called the master, why they are called university discourse, why they are called hysterics discourse and analytic discourse is a question one will have to answer as one goes along, one will have to show. This opens for, for philosophy one other set of questions. What is the philosophy of, I'm uh, putting it as an X now, that desubstantialized placeholder called the subject? What is it that it will be? How will we make sense of that? And, and that, that becomes a question now. Now, this question, think of Let's think of philosophy in a period where we were seeing two trends 
and I cannot develop these two trends at all today. Okay. One, lend you my chair. Uh, uh, one that opens up the question of the subject in what could be called philosophies of the subject. And one which was suggesting the death of the subject, and I have in mind a whole range of thinkers, uh, Levi-Strauss, Structuralist Linguistics, Foucault, Epistine, to be precise, archaeological work, um, Althusser. So while the subject was being erased, and on the other hand, the subject as a substantive inner eye was being rehabilitated, which is either, I believe, therefore I am, I think, therefore I am, I'm free, I choose, therefore I am, and a host of possibilities are opening up in the philosophy of the subject, and there is the philosophy of the structure which erases the subject. It is here at the cusp of these two possibilities, on the one hand, the philosophy of a rather substantive subject with an insight, with an inner world, and on the other hand, the philosophies of structure which puts to question the very possibility or modicum of the subject is where psychoanalysis places itself. So there are two more over here. Okay. On the one hand, we have philosophies of subject. On the other hand, we have philosophies of structure in terms of which this is good. And, and that opening uh, needs to be taken note of. And once you take note of that opening, you put the Cartesian statement, the proposition over here, I think, therefore I am, this proposition is now rendered slim, the therefore is a very slim moment in logical reasoning, marked by a kind of prim primal doubt, who am I? And this leads to an understanding of a desubstantialized Cartesian subject. And that's the term. It's not a doing away with Descartes, but rendering Descartes interesting in terms of dislocation and rehabilitation. Rendering the therefore, the logical, desubstantial. Rendering it in that sense, taking it a step ahead, from the question of who am I to the question where am I? And that is the turn that psychoanalysis provides. Rewriting this statement, I think, therefore I am, as I think, there I am. And that there, the place, that placeholder, the non-place of place, or the place of non-place, is the interesting moment over here. However, that therefore, once you have taken the subject out and you have put the subject question as a question not of who I am but where I am, the subject splinters into a fourfold possibility, which was my other point when I said the unconscious is not inside, the unconscious is outside, the unconscious is the other's discourse. And the subject is now placed in terms, I've written that therefore, as if for you are now, I think therefore I am, I think therefore I am fourfold. And in that sense, the subject's logical presentation is in terms of a fourfold discourse. And this discourse is only fourfold, it's not Foucauldian discourse that you can have infinite number of discourses because there's a logical order and we'll see what the order is. Okay. In that sense, master's discourse, university discourse, 
historic discourse and analyst discourse. And why there are four is a very, very interesting question. But Lacan always wanted slim structures. He felt a structure that is too classificatory <coughs> is no classification at all, just like the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual with which psychiatrists work, is no classification because it's classifying anything and everything. So, so that cannot be a, a nosology at all. A nosology has to be simple and structural in terms of subject position, not in terms of subject behavior. Because subject behavior is a particularity of an infinite kind. So, and, and we can have debates on that. So, uh, uh, this is how it opens up. This then opens up for us. So, what I have done is that, Given philosophies of structure and the erasure of the subject, subject has been rehabilitated but as a slim possibility. Slim logical or slim non -place. Given philosophies of subject where there is a substantive I, a self, the subject has been put outside. And it's outsidedness that is all that the subject has. This is scale. This takes us to the next point, and that's the psychoanalytic question one raises for philosophy. I think, therefore I am, or it thinks, therefore I am. And this opens up the whole question of subject and object in classical philosophy. Is it I think, therefore I am, or is it a kind of predicate marked by it? It thinks, the unconscious is outside, the unconscious is the other's discourse. It thinks, therefore I am. Am I getting marked by something that is thinking for me? Now what is that kind of thing? is the question, which actually necessitated those terms, unconscious is structured like a language, etc., etc. Why does it happen? Okay. So in that sense, the question of it thinks then problematizes the eye. So the next layer question that comes is that even if you have rehabilitated a rehabilitated subject in terms of I think, the predicate of thought could be it thinking and not I thinking. So that opens up thinking itself for a little bit of thinking. And this is a situation now for the subject. It's a dark room, a gun is held to your head and you are asked, choose thought or being. There's a choice you're putting. It's a classical choice put to philosophy in the Cartesian theater. Gun held to head, you are asked to choose thought or be. And you have a problem over here. If you stop thinking, you have been. But then you have to think to stop thinking and you have lost you. If you stop to think, whether you will stop thinking, you have once again lost me. And you are always in this paradox in philosophy. Rather than close this dialectic or this play, did Descartes keep it open? Or are there two Descartes? One, who reached the limit of the play, gun held to head, amnes or thought. If I think, I lose being. If I stop thinking, I have been. But if I stop to think, I've lost it. Placed in this paradox, Descartes can open two possibilities. One, substantialize the I, mark it by a logical therefore, I think therefore I am. Desubstantialize the I, keep the dialectic open, keep the play going. 
And this is a choice. Interestingly, now I'll take it back. It's not a choice. Psychoanalysis poses to philosophy. It's a choice. Philosophy poses to philosophy. It's a choice. Philosophy poses to philosophy in terms of what is philosophy. Hmm. Heidegger's question was what is philosophy? And his answer was philosophy is Greek. But here is one more question. Whether, whether philosophy would substantialize the subject or work with a desubstantialized placeholder. And this is a question of true philosophy itself. Interestingly, psychoanalysis <coughs> can go either ways. Psychoanalysis, in its moments of weakness, is distinctly Cartesian. It substantializes the I, the self, conceives of the subject as something inside, etc., etc. And it's very important to see what I'm calling the psychoanalytic term, most of the time, is a Cartesian term. So, so, so what I've now done is scrambled the box a little bit. It's not psychoanalysis, philosophy. It's not philosophy after psychoanalysis. There are two moments in philosophy, and there are two moments in psychoanalysis. It's a question of which way one would track the idea. This then opens up. Huh? 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 This then opens up a fourfold framework in psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, once it faces this problem, not this one, the there, the place, the question of the place. opens up a whole set of questions in psychoanalysis and the question takes again accidentally it's accidental why am i ending up with a fourfold frame again and again uh, a fourfold frame to conceptualize the subject framework one Conscious, unconscious, sometimes the pre-conscious through it. This we know. Framework two, the most discredited framework, id, ego, superego. Framework three, a framework for the subject. Who am I or where am I? developed in a much read piece of Freud, but read for other reasons, not for the reasons I will invoke today, called mourning and melancholy. It's a much read piece, even in trauma literature. And the fourth is a piece hardly read, Freud's short four-page paper on the mystic writing pad, where mind is conceptualized as a writing apparatus. I'm wrong, but I'm just putting it as a shorthand. That's all. Derrida had the kindness to write on the mystic writing pad and rehabilitate the mystic writing pad, not so much into philosophy, but much more into psychoanalysis. This then opens up for us a fourfold framework of, and, and this is a doubt, Freud is torn between these at least four frameworks. There may be more. I have found four till to date. There are at least four philosophies of the subject in these. Okay. The <coughs> two much talked about I'm not coming up today. Conscious, unconscious. Only one thing I've done to the conscious, I put the conscious outside. Uh, the unconscious outside. Now, okay. Uh, uh, the unconscious is in the hyphen with the other's discourse. This other. 
to Lakshmi and Mother, the Bita. Two, conscious, unconscious, ego, super ego. I'm not developing it. I'll develop the ego, super ego as a framework thereafter. I'll read it completely differently from the way it's usually read, either as the seething cauldron of instincts. Freud never uttered the word instinct in his life. Uh, uh, and uh, ego as mediating between a super ego function and the ego and all of that. Uh, that's one thing. What I'll develop is morning melancholia and mystic writing pad as two frameworks. In morning melancholia, the question before Freud in two minutes is this. X, I have to be mathematical in this, X has lost Y. What is expected? X will be sad, etc., etc. Slowly the sadness will fade and X will move on and live life thereafter. This is what Freud thought was usual of all of us. Now whether all subjects, all cultural formations mourn this way is a question. That we lose, we get saddened, then we get less saddened and less saddened and less saddened and then we move on to another object. Do all of us live life that way is a question. But there was a puzzle to Freud after this. There were some people who had lost what? Their response was a little different. They were not sad necessarily. They were generally sad. They blamed themselves for the loss. In the first instance, they either blamed fate, God, or the other for the loss, you left me. In these instances, the subject blamed herself for the loss. The structure of the enunciation was, I did not love him enough, <coughs> hence I lost him. And this led to a subject structure of guilt, repentance, self beratement and one word Freud uses in Morning and Melancholia, loss of self-esteem. The subject was as if eating herself. This opened for our thinking a moment where one could think of a subject who has inside the trace of the lost other. There's a place. The other is not there in a substantive sense. The shadow of the other, the penumbra of the other is inside. And as if the subject can have interesting relationships with external others. This led, of course, in psychoanalysis to thoughts like introjection, projection, etc., etc. But the critical, critical angle over here is that the subject is not a substantive, foreclosed I. The subject is an infinite play with others, but put mathematically, the subject is an other. Put in a formulaic way, the subject, which is looking subject, self, me, I, is an other. The other is inside. Or at least the shadow of the other, the affective shadow of the other is inside. And when we are contending with the subject, we are contending with the split nature of the subject. <clears throat> the subject is split. 
fourth basic writing pad it opens up one more question for the subject and I don't know whether we remember the magic slate not anymore we play video games now so uh, but uh, some of us may have worked with it in our childhood younger days uh, a magic slate is an apparatus where you can write on the surface and there is a wax slab below and you move the stylus the writing goes and you can write again the two possibilities that it opened up for Freud were one available innocence on the surface that you can write again and again on the surface you can write any and retain trace on the wax slab whatever is re written is retained and you can write again on the surface there is an available innocence and there are retained traces retained traces below that remain this opens two questions for us one let me get about this now there is a script on the surface a script of the subject which is within the domain of the transfer or the communicable or the comprehensible which is within the available play a dictionary offers but there is on the wax lab a script that is illegible because on the wax lab the script that is taking shape slowly is not the surface script. <coughs> it is written, it has a history, and that history is writing itself in a certain way. So you write Freud, and over that, and it goes on. The script keeps developing. Okay. So you, you wanted to write something on top of that you write both but you also have something else so the script that is developing is like a horapomanjara script it's not a script available to our usual communicative strategies there's a, there's a script somewhere else now is this script working itself out as we try to think of this proposition which opened up the question it thinks therefore I am as if you are being written as you write so the theory of the subject requires a sophistication of being written as you write. Is there a tractional pull? The illegible script is often as you go on writing. Is there a traction on your writing, on your innocence? So that, that becomes one kind of a question over here. This led thereafter a point I cannot really develop today maybe in questions I can come to it I would not have wanted to write script like this I prefer now to write script like this and this is what Derrida developed actually in his work on cryptonymy um, which was the text I was doing in deconstructing novels at this time uh, uh, how there is a crypt. So take the subject question deeper on the subject who is finally in question, 
The subject is not just a surface script, an available innocence. The subject is not just an illegible script. The subject is also a crypt. What is a crypt? Why is the subject the script of a crypt? Here, the turn that Abraham and Dorok, the two Hungarian psychoanalysts, and there they actually never went Lacan's way. He never went Winnicott's way. Uh, he actually <coughs> took to two unknown psychoanalysts, Abraham and Dorok, two Hungarian psychoanalysts. Hungary was not even in the map of psychoanalysis till suddenly uh, he discovered psychoanalysis of his disposition uh, in Abraham and Dorok. And I don't have the time to develop that, but that's one interesting interface between philosophy and psychoanalysis. And there is somebody actually who struggled all his life because he was never happy uh, with psychoanalysis. But he was never <coughs> unhappy with psychoanalysis. So he, he always had a very difficult relationship with psychoanalysis. And finally, in Abraham and Dorok's work, he really finally finds, okay, okay, I can, I can uh, develop post-deconstructive possibilities over here. So, so that is that is what happened. So, what what this worked on, and I, I cannot develop this. This this is uh, difficult to do today. Uh, what 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 he opened up was that that the subject. The unconscious structure like language offered us syntax, interesting syntactic structures, and I'll give you one example only. I cannot. I cannot but love you. I cannot love you, I love you, are available in our sense. I cannot but love you. The insertion of the but is what makes the subject question interesting. It's, it's what puts the question of the subject on the subject who is finally in question into an interesting mode and they wanted to study this. They open further the question of phonetic work. So it was an attention to language for phonetic regularities and irregularities. It was also to me. So syntax, phonetic structures and meaning constituted for them, for Derrida, what he called, I need to write it, the forbarium of the subject. So they were actually looking at the Wolfman case, uh, the Wolfman case of Sigmund Freud, which I think is the watershed case actually in the history of psychoanalysis. The Wolfman case is psychoanalysis. Let me be mad enough to say this as it's getting recorded. Uh, uh, the Wolfman case begins in 1910 and ends around 1960s. It's as old as psychoanalysis. Okay. The history of psychoanalysis is the history of the Wolfman case. I may uh, 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 say this with all the attendant risks. Okay. Uh, and, and, and it's a watershed case, they study that case, and, and what comes out of it is that they call it the verbarium, the patient's verbarium. Okay, they, they, they work on that. What it opens up is an attention to tabooed words, to silent words, to tabooed words in the subject. This is the crypt. Okay. And Crypt is a very, very difficult concept, actually. Uh, Derrida has really given it uh, uh, a spin, uh, unthinkable spin, actually. 
uh, he first portrays the script as place, as topographical, but then says it is not topographical, it is tropographical. I use the tropos of space only. The crypt as a tropos of space. He then moves to the crypt as that which is buried. So he relates crypt to death, that which is dead, the living dead inside, that which is tabooed, dead, the sepulchre of the dead. He, he opens up the crypt that way. And finally he moves to crypt as, as to cipher. C-I-P-H-E-R. So he, he develops three mutually constitutive <coughs> understandings of the crypt. Tropographical, death, burial, sepulchre, the buried, the living dead, and then to cipher. I don't have the time to develop crypt, but this may the script of the subject critic. Okay. Uh, and the, the crypt then becomes an interesting question uh, within which it needs to be placed. But take it a step further. So we have traveled conscious, unconscious, we have put the unconscious outside. The unconscious is the other's discourse, otherwise it's Cartesian. Cartesian substantialization of the I or the subject. And psychoanalysis itself can fall in this trap and much of psychoanalysis lives in this trap till to date. Uh, you move, id ego super ego is what I have not touched. You move to mystic writing pad and the critic and the crypt. This opens up a space, a question for philosophy and for the social sciences as well when we deal with the question of the subject. That takes me back to that originary question on the subject which is finally in question. Whether you generate narratives, whether you write on the philosophy of the subject, it doesn't matter. It's the subject which is finally in question, who is finally in question, or the where of the subject is finally in question. Where is the subject? Is it inside or is it outside? And, and this, this opens up a, a, a set of configurations. Can I take two more turns huh? and end? Huh? Or are we getting late? Tell me, I can customize. <laughs> It depends on the number of overs. Doesn't matter. You bat accordingly. <laughs> so, uh, twenty overs, or fifty overs. One has to learn to bat accordingly. Uh, so, uh, uh, in that sense, uh, having put the subject here, let's take. Let me decide. Two more times. Uh, just to open up. What is the question that is coming to us? This takes us then to one angularity, and I don't want to hide this angularity. Okay, a question that psychoanalysis raises for philosophy. Philosophy, historically dealing with the subject in its D and risking it, depathologized expression. So when we are dealing with the subject question, we are dealing with a subject that is overtly depathologized, that's overtly neutered, that is overtly innocent. This subject is difficult to find. This opens up a kind of reflection. And I owe it to Freud, early works of Freud, where Freud opens up an understanding of the subject. And I'm taking three very simple subject positions. 
Okay. Uh, it's quite crazy what I'm about to do just now. Okay. And there is no truth in what I'm doing. Okay. It is only to get a sense of the deep apologized subject. Okay. Interestingly, this footnote should be there. Pathology is not a problem. And we'll see why it's not a problem. Go back to that classic framework. Super ego, ego any. Let's see whether we can do something interesting with that framework. A framework that has been much criticized, much problematized in philosophy especially. Not in psychoanalysis so much. In philosophy it has been problematized all along. Given this, Let us put this relationship, and it's a mad relationship, but I'm just trying to set it up. This is the world, and this is the being in the world. If this is the world, and if this is the being in the world, the subject's way of setting up oneself as one grows through kinds of infantile childhood processes is there is this negotiation between the taboo, the totem, the law of the father, the inner instincts, and we have doubts about that now, and the mediating ego function. And the kind of subject that we will have based on this. And this opens up in psychoanalysis precisely three possibilities. <coughs> Classically in Freud. One, you mediate this and you live life once this function is instituted. So you live life within the law of the father, the taboo function, and you have certain propensities within it. The other possibility, Freud Marx, what if this is not instituted? one doesn't have the law or the name of the father as instituted. What happens to this subject? This subject has, in its negotiation with the world, the ego and the id working out as a dialectic between the two without the institution of the name of the father or the father function. <clears throat> Without the institution of the law of the father. And these two possibilities <coughs> for an always worked out. One, much of the neurotic conformity we all are in that we all conform to a culture of clothing and civility and a few civilizational parameters and we all work with a little tolerable torment with respect to the sexual is one work over here. The other work is where the law of the father is not instituted. In other words, the function, the father function, the taboo function is not instituted. This is absent. And these are the two possibilities Freud worked on and saw the human subject 
as either neurotic or psychotic. There are other distinctions over here, hysteria and obsession within neurosis and perversion, which is a third. I'm not getting into that. It's not needed for our discussion today. We <coughs> have done the full structure, but the two possibilities Freud discusses for the human subject are neurotic conformity and psychotic excess. I'm calling it excess with a little trepidation. Okay. The psychotic excess, the non-need to be closed, the need not being instituted, the need to be closed in a public gathering not to be instituted. So within that, the subject is placed. And I'm only using two frameworks, neurosis and psychosis. And this is the classic framework, actually. The very short piece, Neurosis and Psychosis by Freud, the, the, the very early piece he wrote, uh, marking this distinction in terms of this simple formulation. But what it shows is that, that the subject question is is not a question that can be dealt with, let me be careful over here, without the no. That's all I wanted to arrive at. That the subject question has to be dealt with in terms of the no or the not. That we cannot have the subject question in terms of affirmation. The subject question has to be dealt, and you now see, I put but over here, the but is itself a no or a not, that, that puts the subject to a not. K-N-O-T. Okay, so it puts the subject to the question of a not, and the subject cannot be dealt with only in the affirmative. The subject has to be dealt with in the level of the not. And this actually, just to wind up, just to end, this is where I put the title. I think where I am not. I am where I think. These two cannot be collapsed into a substantive I or subject. That is the problem. So the choice as if I think and when I predicate subject on thought, I lose being. And when, when I predicate subject on being, I lose thought. And this opens up. And I just wanted to show this very quickly actually because this is this is a discussion that, that takes time, that takes time to develop actually, how the knot uh, is is a is a fundamental knot in the subject and, and the question of, of the no. Uh, and in French N O M uh, uh, is is a twofold play. It is name and no. So it's is the name of the father and the no of the father. Okay. So in that sense, uh, uh, how, how, how uh, this statement then got written, uh, I think where I am not, uh, I am where I think not. The interesting point over here, see, and, and it's, sometimes, it's sometimes missed, Lacan rewrites the logical of the proposition as spatial. I think where I am not, I am where I think not. And, and sometimes we think he's saying therefore. No, he's not saying therefore. He's saying it in terms of the question of the place or the non-place of place over here, which is why the question of void also became important over here. This then opens up uh, as, as you go along. Uh, two sets of questions open up for the subject. One, one has to take note of that, and that I think, think can be clearly marked 
it was marked um, for the first time by Otto Winninger. He's an Austrian philosopher. Uh, I don't know whether uh, we have read him. An Austrian philosopher who at the age 24 committed suicide. But before he committed suicide, uh, he wrote a book, a book on woman. It's a very problematic book. But it's a book that wrote woman for the first time in philosophy. And I'm saying first time with all its attendant risks, okay? Uh, but, but let's face it as that. And this text is rewritten by Freud and it's called Female Sexuality or Feminine Sexuality or On Female Sexuality, 1933-34. It's rewritten by Lacan in 1974. It's called Encore again, yet again, and the book is on Feminine Sexuality. But it's not just a question of woman. What it opens up just like the depathologized subject, and pathology is not a problem, pathology is the promise of the subject. Just like the depathologized subject, philosophy's subject is a desexualized subject. And psychoanalysis opens up for us the question of sexuation. The sexuation at the heart of the subject. It is not a question of deconstructive relationships with gender, identity, etc. It's not gender trouble and all that. It's not bodies that matter. Okay. It's not deconstruction of sexual or gender identities. It is a question that the subject is foundationally, formatically sexed. There is no subject outside of sex. And this is a question philosophy has to attend in terms of both I and it. <coughs> the I that it talks of, and even if it talks of the it now, okay, the it that it talks of. This opens up a really problematic domain with respect to sexuation, the infamous Lacanian maxim there is no such thing as a sexual relation. This is seminar 20. There is no such thing as a sexual relation. Now, what does he mean by that? What is he trying to say? What do we mean when we say there is no such thing as a sexual relation? I don't have the time today to develop it, okay? But it shows once again that the assumption, and here Lacan was actually problematizing Aristotle's division of the two sexes into two halves. And it's worth pondering upon, why do we always say my other half? What is half about her? Okay. Or, or my better half? But what is half? Why half? Why do we always say half? Where did we get half? It's worth asking. And you'll find the answer in Aristotle, actually, who halves it. And these are the two halves. They get separated and they yearn thereafter to come together. And they come together and form a whole, form a closed circle, and they are happy ever after, etc., etc. It goes on. Okay. The, the phantasm, the fantasy, or the fairy nature of the tale is in this kind of way. What Lagan is doing, see, is problematizing this very <coughs> unity, this very wholeness, this very closed circle. And in seminar 20, you will see, he says, there is no scientific revolution in Copernicus. placed the earth with the sun. Right? At the center. There is no scientific revolution. And now, 
It's not the sun that would orbit, it's the earth that would orbit. He felt in his madness, right or wrong, that Kepler, who suggested the elliptical orbit, is the scientific revolution. Who rendered elliptical the fantasy of the circular closed world. The elliptical or the non-uniform or the non-collapsible relationship between the two sexes or between any self and other. So the relational context is also rendered problematic in psychoanalysis when they suggest, and I cannot really demonstrate so quickly how they uh, uh, try to prove there is no such thing as a, as a, as a sexual relation. Uh, what do they mean by that? But uh, what do they suggest is that the, uh, a, a sexed relationship marking the sexes is a slim possibility. It will either, and, and in all probability, it will collapse into the register of one angularity or one kind of angularity. So, so it's very difficult to, to mark. I, I know I'm not doing justice to this, to this proposition that there is no such thing as a sexual relationship. Uh, and the stress is on relationship over there. And the stress is on sexing, the, the sexed nature of the subject or the sexuated nature of the subject rather than making love having sex. That's a, that's a uh, mundane point, actually, mm -hmm. over here. It's a question of the sexed nature of the subject. Uh, uh, that, that, that becomes important. Uh, uh, this then renders the subject, and I'll open only two points, uh, and, and maybe end with that for the time being. Um, two angularities of them. One, the subject has to be conceptualized beyond the reality principle. One has to make sense of the subject question beyond what is simply available in reality. This would take us to the real, but I can't go there. The subject has to be perhaps experienced beyond the rationality principle. which in Socratic thought is acrasia, which they understood as motivated irrationality. Motivated irrationality. The subject understood beyond reality principle, beyond rationality principle. The subject understood beyond the pleasure principle beyond the simple self-maximizing or utility-maximizing subject of self-transparency. A subject not substantialized at the level of reality, simple, available, innocent reality, the surface script. A subject to be accessed at the level of illegibility and the cryptonymic nature of it's beyond the reality principle. A subject not to be accessed simply at the level of the rationality principle, but a subject that is acratic. <coughs> and acratia is a constitutive mode of the subject and how you deal with it. A subject that has to be understood beyond the pleasure principle, a subject that is not just self-destructive or thanatotic <coughs> in its disposition, but a subject that is also marked by the not. A subject that is constitutively marked by the not. And by the rather difficult syntactic framework 
I cannot but love you. That's just just one example. A subject beyond the either or. We usually tend to try to get the subject between the either and or, tea or coffee. But the subject is frequently placed in a situation taking off from the not between neither nor. And this was the Wolfman case actually. Like if one goes through the case, one sees clearly how the subject is marked by an ambivalence, an ambivalence of the not, a neither nor that is not resolved. It's an ambivalence that is not resolved. So, a subject beyond <coughs> the either or, and an ambivalence uh, in psychoanalysis was inaugurated by an Indian, uh, Gilindra Shekhar Bose, uh, who, in the history of psychoanalysis, is a philosopher of ambivalence. The 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 premium, the weight the logical weight on ambivalence that, that he puts as, as not repression. Repression is central in early Freud, not in late Freud. Uh, but in early Freud, repression is central. But Glinda Shekhar Bose shifts psychoanalysis to a philosophy of ambivalence, not a philosophy of repression. And repression is what is operative in this structure most. It, it works with this, with this framework. Um, in that sense, uh, it's a it's a beyond either or. It's a it's a it's a framework of the neither nor, and and we can go on like this. So so just four we have done uh, uh, beyond reality principle, beyond rationality principle, beyond either or, beyond the pleasure principle, and and that is where the question of the subject uh, is placed, and and. And uh, that is where uh, the difficult, very difficult relationship between philosophy and psychoanalysis is marked. And, and it's, a, it's a relationship that will have the same difficulty as we are having with there is no such thing as a sexual relationship. So uh, psychoanalysis and philosophy cannot simply come in speak to each other, have communication, get married, and live happily ever after, uh, there will be always uh, be the kind of difficulty uh, we have uh, when we have, there is no such thing as a sexual relationship. That becomes a kind of paradigmatic proposition that hereafter would haunt any setting up of a relationship. Every relationship remains haunted uh, uh, by this, by this uh, possibility, this also renders ontology ontological, and, and that is a problem. Uh, both philosophy and psychoanalysis will have to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, so the statement, the first statement you began by saying that I think therefore I am. So you went on to explain the subject as a social narrative, the four for discourse, which we explained. I haven't, but it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you. Everything did not be done. Uh, you are giving it, but sir. There is an aspect of the subject which you cannot explain. For example, when I feel a pain as a subject, you can never experience that. You can never feel that. So your, your conclusions, uh, as I can put, subject as an other, when you cannot understand my feeling, how can you say that subject as an other? That is one thing. But I want to pose a little more deeper question. Now to explain subjectivity, subject, you have given this framework. So, does this framework explain the phenomenal aspect of the subject? Phenomenal that is the aspect, aspect, of who? aspect of this. For example, I am here yeah, to the subject. I as a phenomenon, I when I 
cry, I have a feeling. So that feeling is purely unique to me and that is a phenomenal aspect of me that which distinguishes from others. Okay, so does this framework explain that phenomenal aspect of the subject? If no, what happens to psychoanalysis after philosophy? See, uh, your first, uh, should I answer the problem or take all the questions? Uh, shorter answers I can do, quickly. Uh, uh, the first one, the first question that you asked, is a question that is being asked. The point is not whether I can know you. The point is whether you know yourself. Whether you know yourself well enough to render public a proposition about yourself. One. That's a question. And the question of it thinks is where this self-knowledge is taken away from me. It's not other knowledge. It's self-knowledge that is in doubt over here. And I don't know. Akhil Bilgrami has been coming here. Have you? Uh, you, you may have read his book, Self-Knowledge. Uh, that's a forgotten article, perhaps. Huh? But uh, amazing work on self-knowledge and uh, psychoanalysis, actually. Uh, where Akhil Bilrami uh, looks at uh, the question of self-knowledge over 400 pages, I think, uh, uh, classic exposition on what is self-knowledge. So here the question, and, and it has a chapter on psychoanalysis towards the end of the book. Amazing chapter, actually. Uh, so so uh, there the question would be, not whether I have other knowledge, the question is, what is the kind of self-knowledge I Second question that you are asking, phenomenological. The question before us is, even if you go philosophy's way, which phenomenology are we talking of? Husserlian phenomenology? Heideggerian phenomenology? Moldo Ponte? Or am I talking of phenomenology post Lacan, who was trying to reread Heidegger and Moldovati? So one would always need to ask this question which phenomenology? Even in philosophy, which is why I'm opening this question, which Descartes? So it's a rehabilitation of Descartes. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting reading of Descartes. Okay, it's not giving up on Descartes, it's a retaining the subject question, the question of the cogito. But the cogito is structured like the unconscious. The cogito is not a conscious, deliberative, self-rationalizing cogito. But the cogito is structured like the unconscious. The unconscious is structured like the cogito. Okay. So in that sense, one will have to put on the table which phenomenology are we talking about. So that would be my, my request and, and uh, my push key. Uh, because there is hidden in psychoanalysis a kind of phenomenology. And the Lacanian imaginary, I don't want to drop names or terms over here, okay? Uh, 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 I have tried not to use any of the technical terms of psychoanalysis, but uh, since you are pushing the question in that direction, the Lacanian imaginary, not the symbolic and the real, is a very interesting work on phenomenology. But that has to be seen, which phenomenology. Yeah. So you emphasized on the notion of a space and you didn't speak anything about time. So I where am I? Emphasized the notion of space. Yeah. Yeah. Please. You didn't speak anything on time. Is there? You didn't say anything on time. So where am I is important here, not when am I. See, I did not want to go the time way today. Couldn't have. Because one way, and, and okay, let me just not even answer. Uh, 
when I say, why do I say I say, when it is said, uh, where, the where is a predicate of both space and time. Mm -hmm. It's a, the where is a time-space curvature. Mm -hmm. What we did today was to mark a place, not space also, mark a place. Mark a place for the subject, post the desubstantialization of the Cartesian subject. Now, that's all we could do. Where is the predicate of time in being and time is a question. Now, I don't have the time to develop this. The kind of formal principles primarily late Lacan and now Alan Badiou are trying to develop in terms of the mathem and set theory okay, is where they are trying to reframe being and time post Lacan. So that would be one direction but I did not go at all in that direction today because I was only marking the elsewhere, the subject as being elsewhere, the subject as being different from the substantialized Cartesian subject. But the other route we could have taken, that's a very interesting discussion, uh, where uh, the subject is understood in terms of inhabited time, the inhabited other time, or the temporality of the other subject. What I have gone and you have you have you have got me right actually or let me put it you have caught me right. Okay. Uh, that's a fine thing actually. What I have done see I have all along used place. The place of the father, okay. the 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 place of the cryptonymic. I've throughout, and I, it's a deliberate deliberate strategy actually. And and I and I thought ki, I will only develop the there, and I move from the therefore to the there. Okay. And if I manage time, I move to therefore, but I couldn't. I haven't managed it. Okay. Uh, but that's fine. We have moved from therefore to there. Now. Where in the there is time? And this entire discussion can be worked out in terms of time. And, and, and actually the very interesting piece in Ekri by Lacan is, it's called logical time and the question of anticipated certainty. Logical time and the question of anticipated certainty and that is the text where in terms of time he marks the question of the subject who is finally in question. He actually, see, in, in, in actually two routes are taken. I haven't taken either over here. One is the piece on the Poulain letter, which is the first piece, okay, where he sets up the subject question, puts the subject outside. In logical time and the question of anticipated certainty, okay, he brings up the question of time and that would have been another route how uh, the track could have been marked in terms of being and time. Which actually uh, among the contemporary philosophers, Alan Badiou is somebody who is trying to mark it in a, in a certain way his rewriting of being and time as being an event. Okay. And it's a difficult text. Uh, I've taken many years and I and I will not say I've understood it fully. Okay. But that is where the question of other time is brought in. Today you have caught me right. I only stuck to place. The the non-place of place. I did not go the time way, but that's a very important point in in fact psychoanalytic time is a very important question.
rather than psychoanalytic elsewhere. And your question is an important question. But that will require a deliberation and a reflection. And it's worth doing it. Um, what is psychoanalytic time? Not is one way of looking at knotted time. But that's a very simple understanding of time. That's, a, that's very simple. Huh? That a very sophisticated historian like say Tipesh Chakravarti would also do it. Okay. But what is the dangerous propensity or the scary propensity of psychoanalytic time is what one wants to explore. What would it mean to being and dying? Yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic talk, but that seems to create a new Cartesian doubt, I see. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, I think I'm, I'm not really uh, like fit for this later discussion because it's too profound from the point of view of philosophy. But then back to Descartes, it's okay. much safer. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I think this is the same problem of most of the philosophers of rationalism, yes. that they create certain terms yes. uh, rational, in the framework of rationalism, and which is so reduced, like, uh, and, and under which everything is subsumed. Yes. And take this, I think, yeah, and as you, as you point out, that uh, deconstruction of that Cartesian substantialization of subject that started immediately after this postulation uh, at the time of Descartes, yes. Princess Elizabeth of yes. Berman yes. and Pierre Gassendi, yes. who asked, uh, is it the only subject that thinks like logical yes. subject? Yes. There is a pre-logical subject yes. Yes. Yeah, that acts bodily and yes. most important, per perception. Yes. So the subject of perception should be differentiated from the subject of pure thinking or whatever. Yes. The, 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 uh, verbal thinking, yes. and Descartes' answer is uh, these are different modes of thought or thinking. Yes. So thinking as a kind of term, under which everything is subsumed. Yes. But there's a lot of problem. There are a lot of problems with that. Yes. And the, you are right, absolutely. And the major problem is, take the pre-logical subject. There is something that invariably participates in that, which is the world itself. Which is the the world. The body and the world. World. Yeah. 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 I was hearing world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, the 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 the, the, the welt, I would say. Yeah. 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 Uh, so between the philosophical and psychoanalysis and all, there is a third factor, which is the our environment and the world, which immediately participate in the perception. Yeah. And uh, um, and see this. I mean, it, as you rightly point out, this this myth of subject. People say that, oh, seeing is subjective. You open the eyes, you see only object, what's the subject? Yeah. Yeah, so how it is constructed, this purely aesthetical subjectivity? And Descartes actually admitted to uh, Princess that he conveniently ignored that aspect. Yeah. Yeah, because that uh, subject of sensation and subject of volition and all. Yeah. And you come to Kant and it's even more serious. Yeah. Yeah. And again, unshow that uh, intuition uh, and it's it, it, and under which everything is subsumed, that seeing and touching and all. And in transcendental, tra transcendental aesthetics, he deals only with geometry, yes. not with the perspective. Yeah, that immediate perspective yeah. structure of this of seeing and all. So these are very interesting aspects. I think when that thinking is deconstructed, that in that I is also deconstructed in certain sense. I mean, in the strict frame framework of Descartes and post cartesian philosophy. And I really like this aspect, it's great that you knew that I cannot but. And what actually Descartes and most of the post-Cartesian philosophers did to limit the subject using yes, 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 possibility. Mm -hmm. So what subject can and then comes the limit. Yes. And this is a very interesting aspect. Then he say, starting with no, 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 and it opens that, to a great uh, possibility. And, uh, um, and, and, and actually, when you read Kant, the, the, the critique of pure reason, and the beginning, the propedeutic, yeah, you can actually, actually reverse the whole thing. Yeah. It is not the possibility of I and then my limit. It is actually the impossibility that I cannot but accept the world as it is. Yeah? And, then, and then starts the new possibility. So, and, and I, I don't know, I mean, I can only elaborate on that, but I'm finding it a very interesting uh, point. Just one thought is coming. 
that I agree with you, actually. No. Uh, I've seen the... Uh, in the sixth meditation, right? Descartes has to invoke God. Fifth or sixth. I'm not remembering well now. Before fifth, sixth. Before fifth. Huh? Before sixth. I think it's the Before sixth. fourth or something. Yeah. Before fourth. Yeah. yeah, somewhere. Descartes has to invoke finally God. Yeah. This question cannot be sustained. It's very difficult to sustain it, given the questions on perception and intuition that will happen. And finally, he will have to invoke God. Yeah. Like, I should have found out the line now, but it's, it's a very interesting moment in meditation, actually, when he invokes God finally, as if it's going to collapse now, the logical ordering of classical epistemology, and here I have to invoke God. That where will this certainty, the being in the world mm -hmm. that you are marking, where will this come from? So finally, you have to invoke. The other is, see, which is why, that's the point I was trying to mark over there with respect to phenomenology. You know, which is why somebody down the line has to write phenomenology of perception. <coughs> that if I have to rehabilitate it and, and, and bring it back. I mean, never upon you. Not upon you. That is why somebody has, is having to write phenomenology of perception. <coughs> So in, in that sense, uh, you know, all the, let me use the same language, all the buried moments or the buried uh, repositories, let me call them repositories, are then invoked in certain ways. So I, I, I was not hence wanting to do psychoanalysis versus philosophy but the read philosophy in a way that allows us uh, to to invoke uh, uh, so so yeah i mean at least you hope that through this i mean psychoanalysis reinventing philosophy whatever yeah. that uh, at this this habit of rationalism to limit the subject yeah. that could be overcome to a certain extent yes. Yes. Right. that question at least is inaugurated because uh, both psychoanalysis and philosophy may continue to function in a substantialist metaphysics. It's, it's very possible. They, it's a substantialist ethics, substantialist metaphysics of the affirmative. And, and you may carry on that way for long. Psychoanalysis can. Um, uh, actually, there's a lot of like confusion. Like I'm, I'm right now very confused, but I don't know why I'm getting this impression that the dissubstantiation of the Cartesian subject uh, through psychoanalysis or uh, through bringing the unconscious out uh, from the purview of inner is an another sort of substantiation, or in in fact, I would say it's an another resubstantiation. It seems that like yeah, is it like, not like, another resubstantiation. Yeah. No, it's it's an another resubstantiation. It it seems to be like an another resubstantiation. That's why I'm trying to say it seems like that uh, like Copernicus. It, it's just displacing centers. It's just uh, moving the substance from the inner to the outer. Otherwise, like uh, it would uh, and uh, had it not been that, then what's that it doing there? This it signifies something. It thinks therefore I am. Rather, in, uh, in the Cartesian epistemology or in this Cartesian maxim, it's both, I think, for my existence. Whereas, uh, in this post, like, desubstantiation, it's this it which, which thinks for my existence. And uh, it seems to me that it's, it's this unconscious which has unfortunately turned into a, like, substance, which thinks for me. And, uh, and there's another question related to it. Like it can be anything. It can be the four discourses. It can be the. And is this unconscious also like taking into account the notion of intersubjectivity? Like what's what's the like uh, uh, what's its stake on another subject? What's its stake on all the other beings uh, like which which are there in with me in the society, which help uh, build up and which help uh, like evolve the social narrative of the four discourses that unfortunately you haven't been. Like you haven't tackled it. That's it. It's a very good question, actually. See, uh, good, you have placed it. 
because that's the mistake most of us make. When I said that psychoanalysis can substantialize quite easily, much of psychoanalysis works like that. Because we do the Copernican term. Okay. It's good you have brought it in. Okay. Now, let me rewind a little bit, let us revisit a little bit. I have invoked it with respect to the I. Step one. And it is looking like it thinks therefore I. That's not what one wants to say, but it can become that. It can become a kind of reverse <coughs> substantialization that okay, it's not I anymore, it's a it that is thinking for you. Okay. However, this was not the statement. And there I think Babu's point is important. And could I went into the knot? The statement is I think where I am not. I am not where I think. I'm not where I think about. Okay. So in that sense, it is not a statement that is replacing I think therefore I am now with it thinks therefore I am. Could you point it? It helps. Okay. This is the substantialist reversal. Mm -hmm. Exactly the reversal I'm worried of. And much of psychoanalysis is driven by this reversal. Now what you have is an I in the garb of the it. The it is now a kind of phenomenal I. Hidden, occulted, elsewhere. Producing its own fractional effect. Mystic, mythical, unknown once again, as slim, logically, propositionally, as I think therefore I am. Not making much of a difference. Okay. What is interesting over here is to mark it in terms of the not. Which is why I did not send the title of the talk and I am not defending myself, okay, as it thinks therefore I am. I sent it as I think where I am not. I am where I think. That paradox, it's the paradox, is what is important. It's not the doxa, but the paradoxa. It's the philosophy of the paradox that is important over here, which is why the not. Movement from the affirmative to the not is very, very important. Without that, this doesn't open. This raised, just allow me to put it this way, one other division, which Heidegger was very suspicious of, is the subject-object division in Western philosophy. Both are put to question over here. There is no substantive self, no substantive other. And there is one, one line in Ekri. There is no other of the other. Now the line is interesting. There is no other of the other that will shear off the lack. Our thinking is, oh, this is the other, and there is lack. But there will be some other of the other after that, which will take care of the lack. I will find fulfillment, wholeness, totality, closeness somewhere, if I can move from other to other to other to other to other somewhere. There is no other of the other that will shear off this lack. So what happens over here is that there is no substantive self or a substantive other. There is no substantive inside or a substantive outside. Because the insidedness of the outside and the outsidedness of the inside is what the crypt is. I can't get into that, but then that deals with it very well. There is no subject and object. The subject is always already under relation. And the object is not available as an objective, objectified reality principle. So what you have is, I don't want to get into that. Is it subjective? It's, no, no, it's, the, it's, it's object. But it's the object PTR, which is the object 
as long as it is the object of fantasy. So the question of fantasy, which is like beyond the reality principle, okay, the question of fantasy becomes very important over here. If fantasy is becoming difficult, let us try to experience it through dreams. Dream. 